<laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I am at four o'clock, uh, whatever time that is for you. So uh, greetings. Welcome to Modify a Million Mark a Month. <laughs> I am Carol Witt from CW Mars, and I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, we have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please note that this session is being recorded and I will be adding a link to the captioning in the chat very shortly. And I will be monitoring the chat for questions and comments and that's both in Zoom and in Feedloop. Uh, I would like to thank all of our sponsors, including those at the champion level. So that's Equinox for sponsoring the platform, ECDI for sponsoring the captions, and Kipu for sponsoring Hackfest tomorrow. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Benjamin Murphy from NC Cardinal. And uh, I will stop sharing this, and then you will be able to share your all right. I know late in the day is a great time to talk about all of the uh, uh, fun things to do with cataloging. So, uh, yeah. Let's see here. Give me just a moment. All right. All right. Can you see my. Time. Yes. <laughs> you guys see my uh, slide deck there? Yes. All right. So. So, this presentation is meant to show you. Um, what we have uh, learned about how you can use your Evergreen database to identify problems with your MARC records, make batch edits using MARC edit, and overlay those changes back into your catalog. So after figuring out this process, we ended up editing more than a million MARC records in the first month. This chart shows the number of BIB records we edited every day for those first few months. We found that we could go through the process of running a query, exporting the records, and making edits on about 100,000 records within an hour. So I'll walk you through what we learned. So big picture, first we run queries to target specific cataloging issues in the MARC records. Our process was designed using PG Admin to query our Evergreen Instances Postgres database. I'll also show you how to do this using the reporter. We then used Evergreen's batch export to export the MARC records to a file. We edited the records using MARC edit and then re-ingested them. We used a tool called BibMagic to ingest and overlay, but Evergreen's batch importer is also a possibility. So our recommended tools are PG Admin for querying the Evergreen database, Notepad++ for editing text files, MARC edit for editing MARC records, and BibMagic for ingesting and overlaying records in bulk. For us, the efficiency of the whole process hinged on our use of Bib Magic. If you're not familiar with it, Blake from Mobius did a presentation on it at last year's conference. There's a link to that presentation at the bottom of this slide. Bib Magic is available freely on GitHub, but needs to be installed on your server by your hosting provider. I see that Blake is here in the uh, chat, so maybe he can uh, share a, a link to the presentation from last year. But essentially, it's a way to manage the import of BIB records. Our primary use of it was to ingest, deduplicate, and delete resource URLs from our electronic resources. It allows you to set up configurations for each ingest process to add or drop fields. For our e-resources, we have it set up to match existing records and only add a new 856 for a library's specific access link if the e-resource record already exists or create a new bib record if that e-resource bib doesn't exist, but clean up the mark to remove things like thumbnail URLs and other non-resource specific content. If you have things to delete, you can also feed it a deletes mark file and it will match the records in that file and just remove the specific 856 field for your specific link to that resource, or if that's the only 856 link on the bib, delete the entire bib. So this allows our community members to drop their e-resource mark files in the designated folders and have them be added, deduplicated, or removed without our involvement. But in this context, we have a folder that allows us to drop a mark file into a folder. The process looks at the TCN value in the 901C and overwrites that bib in Evergreen with whatever content the mark file has. So yep, I see there's a link there to last year's bib magic presentation along with the slides. So where did we start? We were looking at how to systematically find cataloging errors and correct them in the catalog. 
So I started off by looking at bib records that didn't have format icons because we use those format icons in our deduplication process. I soon discovered that we had a variety of mark tags in the catalog that were not defined by the Library of Congress, things like 9xx fields with different notes, and even non-numeric mark tags that were the result of erroneous return characters in the description fields. So we worked with our cataloging committee to review the tags we have in our bib records, investigate whether or not they were defined by LOC, and if so, what kind of data they held. This allowed us to create a list of tags that needed to be kept and tags that could be categorically deleted, shown here on the right in this slide. So at a high level, this gave us a list of tags we want and tags we don't want when processing our mark records. We also found that there were a variety of subfields within mark tags that were typos or weren't defined by the Library of Congress. So I built a table of valid subfields for individual mark tags that I could compare against. So for example, strictly speaking, capitalized letters are invalid for subfields. Within these subfields, there's also a valid type of data. So for instance, if the subfield is the year of publication and the data says $25.99, we know that's a problem. So the bulk of our initial edits were cleaning up unwanted mark fields and invalid subfields. But before we get too far down the rabbit hole, let's take a look at the basics of interrogating the mark records in the database. So a few important tables to start off with. Biblio.record entry is the main table for storing bib records, and metabib.fullrec is a table that has all the fields and subfields of a mark record broken down in a granular way so that any subfield in a mark record has its own row in the database. These tables link on the TCN or the bib ID, which is the ID of the biblio.record entry table or the record of the metabib.fullrec. So once you're looking at these two tables together, make sure you're not looking at deleted bib records in biblio.record entry. Then you can target what you're really looking for in the metabib.fullrec by limiting the tag, subfield, indicators, or the value of the field. In this example, we're looking at the 856 field, which holds data about the electronic location and access, and specifically the subfield U, which is the uniform resource identifier, AKA the web address. So last point, I limited the uh, query to 1000 because otherwise this query would be looking at all of the 856 URLs in the database, which is too much to look at at once. So here's a comparison of the structure of the data in the biblio.record entry versus the metabib.fullrec. So the biblio.record entry has all of the data packed into the mark field in an XML format, which is good for some purposes. But for targeting specific problems in specific fields, metabib.fullrec has each data element in a separate row in the database. So we'll get into examples of this here in a moment. Let's look at an example case. On the left, we have the list of the valid GMDs we have for our 245 subfield Hs. The query in the center lets us count how many instances of 245 subfield H we have that are not in the list of our valid GMDs. The counts of invalid GMDs we found in the query are on the right. So you can see, for instance, that our list of valid GMDs includes video recording, but we have in our list 7,600 records that have a 245 subfield H of DVD and another 4,000 that have video recording DVD. Once we have a list of popular values that are incorrect, we can use the query of invalid GMDs to look for specific bib records that need to be updated. In this example, we're looking for the most popular values that should, should be video recording, and our output is a list of TCNs. Once we get our results, PG Admin lets us export the results of the query to a CSV file by hitting F8. Essentially what we want is a list of TCNs. So with your list of TCNs, you can then batch export the mark records. Evergreen really can't handle exporting more than about 5,000 bibs at a time. So if you want to edit more than 5,000 records in one process, you'll have to split them up into multiple files. So this is the batch, batch command I use to split up the CSV list of TCNs. I got this off of uh, the internet. You set the origin file name, the number of rows in each resulting file will have, will be in the output, and the file prefix each resultant output file will have. Then you save it with a .cmd file extension, which means it's a command file, and you put it in the same folder as the big list of TCNs and run it. 
Let me show you an example of what that looks like, splitting up these report output into lists of 5,000 TCNs. So step one, we have a list of TCNs called mark tags underscore 245H.csv. We edit our batch command file to include the name of that CSV file and define the prefix of the individual files that have 5,000 or less. We run the command file and we end up with a new batch of CSV files with a maximum of 5,000 TCNs that we'll use for downloading the mark records. Step four, we use Evergreen's batch exporter to download those files. Step five, by default, Evergreen's downloads a file called export.biblio.utf8.usmark, which we can rename to a nice file name with a .mrc extension so we can edit the mark records. In this case, in the example, you can see the purple file there, mark tags.245 uh, underscore 245H underscore one MRC. Now we enter into the world of Terry Reese. So uh, I know that probably many of you were uh, attending Terry Reese's presentation this morning. That was really cool to see. And uh, it's nice that we get to get into a little bit more detail of uh, some of the things that he was talking about. Yes, Kate Coleman, all hail. <laughs> so if we double click on one of those .mrc files and we have mark edit installed, mark breaker will open up, allowing us to create a .mrk text file in the same folder. If we then hit the edit records bucket, it opens up the .mrk file for editing. Once we have the mark editor open, we can open up the edit subfield utility, which is F9 or accessible in the tools menu. Then we can look for specific values in specific mark fields and subfields and fix those values. The preview results dialog will let you see the before and after impact of the changes you're making before you make them. So once you've previewed results to verify that the task does what you want it to do, you can run the batch edit if that's the only change you're trying to do. But in our scenario, this is one step of many that we want to take on this file of mark records. Uh, if you recall, we had a whole bunch of different variations of incorrect versions of the GMD. We want to run that individual edit alongside a bunch of other edits in what mark edit calls a task. So we'll choose copy replace task or copy remove task, copy replace in our case, because we're going to replace uh, that field data. And then we'll see a dialog to let you know the task has been copied. We can then navigate to the task manager in the tools menu. And this will allow you to add that individual edit to a batch of edits. So in this case, we'll make a new task called cleanup 245 subfield H, which is shown here on the left hand side. Then in the tasks window of the edit task list pop up shown here on the right, we can right click and paste the task action we copied when we were testing out the edit in the edit subfield data screen we just showed. So at this point we've copied one of what can be many actions into this new task list. So here's where it gets really interesting. These task lists are saved as text files on your computer. In the manage task screen, one of the fields for the task is path. This shows where that specific task file lives locally on your computer. You can go to that file and open it up in a text editor and you'll see that it's just a tab separated file. In this instance, shown in the bottom left of the screen, you can see there's just one task that I pasted, but that is one of many problems that I wanna fix. So you can see there in the text field, it says subfield underscore edit 245H, and then it has my previous GMD, my new GMD, and some things like that. So since these are tab separated files, you can easily copy and paste their contents into a spreadsheet program like Excel, and then go back to the results from your queries, copy all of the various erroneous values that you wanna make the same correction to, in this case, we're making them all into video recording, and paste them into the rows in Excel to replicate that one command you just created. Now you'll have a task that targets a whole list of known problems that you found from a query without having to run or build the tasks one by one. So this is the, what we're doing here in the Excel screenshot on the left-hand side. We started off with just creating the one that's in the first row, and then we pasted all of the other variations that were wrong into the other rows. We replicated the columns A, B, C, E, and F, and now we've got a bunch of rows. Each row in this task list is a different variation I'm wanting to fix that was pulled from the database and is a specific problem. 
Doing this manually would be challenging because one edit might only be 10 bibs. Or if I can dump all these variations into a list and export the records that I have of all those various problems, I can run this task once per file of 5,000 mark records and clean a variety of problems all at once. So once I've saved that content I duplicated in the Excel file back to the text file I found on my computer, I can go back to the task manager and mark edit, edit my 245 subfield 8 task, and now I see all of those commands I cut and pasted into that single task. I can now run the task on one of my mark files that I know has those specific kinds of issues with the 245 subfield H video related values by going to the tools menu, choosing assign task and selecting my task from the list. Each individual task may make varying numbers of modifications. On the right, you can see the modified mark, including one of the fields that was missed because of a parentheses in the 245 subfield H. So now that you made a bunch of changes to the mark file, this is where you need to be careful and double check your work. One of the things I was most concerned with was making sure that the changes I'm making didn't have unintended consequences. And in some cases I found they did. So mark edit allows you to use regex to find things you're looking for to match. And sometimes the match can be on things you didn't expect or intend. So you should review your edits, especially if you're working on big batches of mark records. So one way to compare the before and after of your change is to use software like Beyond Compare, which shows you the two files side by side, highlighting the changes. I also built a process using Excel that allows me to cut and paste the text content of the MRK file, which is a text file, before and after the edits, and compare the two to see exactly what was done. This lets me focus on changes and look for unintended consequences. So I'm going to post a link in the chat to a uh, Google Doc where you can copy that Google Doc and use it for yourself if you uh, need a way to compare before and after edits in uh, Mark files. Oh, the compare tool in Notepad++ also. Yes, I think that is a uh, plugin that you can get in Notepad++. Good call. So here was a process I came up with using a spreadsheet in VLOOKUP to compare the mark edits before and after. So after you've made the changes in mark edit, you save as to save an edited copy of the MRK file with the changes you've made. Then open your unedited MRK file and your modified MRK file in Notepad++. And like Katie was saying, you could actually just compare at that point. Um, you can also copy the contents of the unedited MRK file into the original worksheet column E. You can copy the contents of the modified MRK file into the edited worksheet in column E. Then you can copy the values in the spreadsheet's original key column and paste them as values into the compare worksheet's key column. I included here on this slide the uh, formulas that I used, um, if that's helpful. So here's the results. Uh, in the top, we can see successful edits. In the bottom, we can see there are instances where the changes weren't made. The reason for this is that the database table we're searching removes capitalization and punctuation. We can tell mark edit to ignore capitalization differences in the edit subfield utility, but the data in metabib.fullrec is normalized, so it doesn't include punctuation like parentheses around the word DVD. So we'll have to either manually edit our task commands or clean it up manually in the edit subfield utility. So part of the benefit of having this be data-driven is you can run these commands, identify the records, paste the erroneous values, create task lists to clean up the easily fixed use cases, and then go back and query again and see what outliers you have or remaining issues you have and still dial it in. So once your edits are looking the way you want them to look in Mark Edit, you can compile the file into Mark in the file menu. Now you're ready to drop the new .mrc mark file into the correct folder using SFTP and let bib magic happen. In our case, it simply overwrites the existing bib record with the edited records we supply where the 901C matches. As an example of our bib magic configurations, there's a screenshot on the right showing some of our e-resource upload folders. Each folder is individually configured to add specific 856 subfield nines for search scoping add consistent 856 subfield Ys, and potentially remove other specific fields that the vendor sends that we don't want to appear in the record. 
So I can appreciate that not everyone has SQL access to their database, and you may need to request Bibmagic to be added to your Evergreen instance. So I wanted to talk through how you can accomplish these kinds of edits using native Evergreen functionality with the reporter and the batch import tools. So if you don't have Bibmagic, you can also upload the edited mark file using Evergreen's mark batch import export tool. So these are the settings we use to ingest and overlay records based on their TCN in the 901C field. We found that if you only use the merge on exact match 901C checkbox in the right column, it doesn't overlay everything. You also have to use merge on best match. The problem with this method is that it's a bottleneck and it's prone to failure if you load more than several hundred records into a single mark file. We wouldn't have found it feasible to do a project of this scale using Evergreen's current mark file upload. If you have other tips and tricks to increase the capacity of this tool, we'd welcome them for the sake of everyone who doesn't have access to Bibmagic. So some of the things you can see here um, on the screen as well are the merge profile that we use uh, there on the right hand side. Um, the configurations we have for our match only merge. And then uh, in the bottom right, we have our record match set. And so that is um, what it uses to determine whether or not something uh, there is a match between different bib records. Um, it's also access, uh, possible to access the granular data in metabib.fullrec by using the source bibliographic record flatten mark fields. My suggestion would be to target the tag and subfield you're looking for and to limit it to the owning library to target the records you're interested in. Using the reporter is much more cumbersome, but you can get at the data in the same way. The normalized value field in the flatten mark field mark fields is where you'll find the data in the subfield. The contents will all be lowercase and without punctuation. So once you have your list of TCNs from the reporter, you can use that to download the mark records to be edited in mark edit. So a couple of things that are going on here, you can see in the core source, we chose bibliographic record. Uh, one of the elements under that is the flattened mark fields. Um, in the source or in the uh, center column, um, you have the indicators, so if it, you have specific indicators you're looking for, uh, the tag, which is the three uh, digit generally number uh, for your mark record, the subfield, if it's subfield A, subfield B, that sort of thing, and then the normalized value is actual content. So in our example display fields here, I'm displaying the TCN value, the author and title from simple record extracts, and the value of that subfield that I'm limiting to. In the filters, uh, I'm choosing to not include deleted records. Um, I have something where I can limit by the tag, I can limit by the subfield, and then I can uh, inquire into the normalized value uh, field and see what we have there. And also just to keep things within scope, uh, the organizational unit ID, if you want to look at that. Um, that helps it, you know, uh, limit things just to your records. Uh, if it's an electronic resource record for us, we wouldn't have anything on the call number volume, so we would have to take that out. So, um, a few lessons that we learned. Um, the more you can lay out what your intended results are in the offset, the less you'll find yourself touching the same record over and over. Um, I know in some instances we touched records four or five times, so maybe it wasn't a million records. Um, but as you progress, you'll develop more skill and capacity. So inevitably, new ideas will come up that will cause you to touch the same records again to fix different problems. If you do need to do the same thing to a large percentage of the records in your catalog, uh, my suggestion is to build that into a default task that you run with every macro um, so that anytime you touch a mark file, you're doing that. And then circle back to those queries later once you've uh, hit a bunch of your records and clean that up. Um, we also did see some slowness when importing or overlaying large batches of files, uh, so we avoid doing that now in the mid-afternoon. Um, I think some of the ingest process uh, modifications recently allow uh, clean up some of that with the indexing separating from the ingesting, um, but we uh, still are careful in the afternoon just so that we don't uh, have a performance impact. Um, 
Another thing is you want your turnaround time to be as short as possible from the time you export the MARC records to the time you re-ingest it to avoid instances where you export the record and then someone edits the record before you make your changes and re-overlay the record. So if you export records but don't get around to editing them promptly, re-export them and make your changes on a fresh export of the MARC records. Um, if you have auditing tables active, making millions of edits will bloat your audit tables. Um, I also save, or I always save a copy of the unedited MARC files on the TCN list in case I need to revert. I had an instance where we were overreaching in a process of removing 776 fields. Um, we were able to go back, use our list of TCN exports, and see which of those records had since been edited, export those newly edited records with the edits, with the changes that users had made, then go back and overlay the original MARC records we exported so that they were back to their original exported state. And then we went back and overlaid the records that users had newly edited with the changes that they had made since we did our batch changes. So this wouldn't have been possible if we didn't keep a clean record of what we did and when we did it. Another favorite thing to do uh, in MARC edit, just one of the things I like, is using control F11 to sort the fields within your MARC records. Uh, it doesn't sort the subfields because sometimes you want those out of alphabetical order um, within a tag, but it just makes sure that the tags, indicators, and their data is in order within each MARC record. Um, so other ideas uh, uh, that we got from our cataloging committee and, and catalogers, um, some of the first things we did were adding format icons, removing mark fields that were invalid um, or we didn't need, deem necessary to retain. Once we had that done, we started looking at other cleanup tasks that we could take on systematically. Uh, some of these suggestions were sort of slowly working through. Um, for example, uh, 020, uh, the ISBN subfield A, we can verify that it's a 10 or 13 character field, uh, character because it does include X in uh, some cases. Um, we can also normalize the format language in subfield Q, uh, remove the price in subfield C. Uh, in the 035, we primarily get rid of everything that isn't OCLC identifiers. In the 250 edition statement, uh, we, are consolid we consolidated multiple instances of the 250 into a single instance, and now we're creating a controlled vocabulary for various editions of our videos uh, because we're working on a video deduplication. Um, in the 300 uh, subfield A, we're changing CA for audiobooks and videos to approximately. In the subfield B, we're changing SD to sound and COL to color. Uh, we also went through our 6xx fields and removed some of the subject headings from invalid sources or sources that we aren't using, and we cleaned up misspellings of valid sources. So the more comfortable we get with it, the more we're adding complexity to our process and tackling a bunch of different edits. So some of our current explorations. Um, one of the current projects we're working on is trying to help a library system genrefy the call numbers in their collection using this process. In this image, we're splitting apart a call number into its Dewey components and mapping a Dewey range to a topic, or a genre in this case. Essentially, we're replacing a Dewey number with a genre value. In our attempts to make these updates in bulk, we're exporting the mark records from Evergreens with their holding information in the 852 fields and then using mark edits export tab delimited records to, defi to define the export fields and output them to a CSV file. So one of the things we had to do was create a task list that got rid of all of the holdings that were for libraries that were not within scope of the thing that I'm trying to do here. Um, once we have the mark data into a comma separated file, we can use the spreadsheet tools like VLOOKUP to bring in modified data on a per record basis. So one of the tricks of this process is that there are multiple 852 fields representing the individual copies attached to a bib, and they're delimited within a cell such as here with the semicolon. You can see how in uh, 852 subfield B, there's multiple locations. Uh, it deduplicated the values in the 852 subfield C, which were the shelving location. Uh, in the 852 subfield J, you can see there's multiple call numbers associated with different copies. You can also see different uh, circ mods in the 852 subfield G, different barcode numbers in the 852 subfield P, that sort of thing. 
So when you're making modifications to this data, you either need to further extract those fields per copy into your spreadsheet and then recombine them once you've made your changes or build the new data in the field in a way that accounts for the multiple instances of the delimited data in that subfield. So here, for example, we're bringing in an updated 852 subfield J, which is our call number field. All of our previous edits have been exporting batches of mark records that had a subset of the same problems, and we run the same task list on all records in that mark file. But this means that we can't make specific edits to assign specific values to specific bibs in bulk. But now that we've made our edits in the spreadsheet, we can use the delimited text translator to go from the CSV data and map the columns in the CSV back into mark subfields. You'll see here on the right side, the fields from the CSV are simply listed as field zero, field one, field two, that sort of thing. And we're defining what those columns map to as specific fields and subfields. These translations can be saved if you're doing the same remapping on a regular basis. So if I'm bringing in these things over and over, I can uh, save that process and don't have to recreate it. What we ended up with was a very simplified mark record with the bare minimum of information, in this case only the 001, which holds the TCN, and the 852 fields, which I chose to export. We can then use mark edits merge records tool to merge that data back in with our source mark files. So these are the interfaces for merging those records back into the source mark file. You identify your source file, your file that your, has the minimal bib record uh, information, which is the merge file, and then the save file. You also have to include your record identifier, and there is a limited list of options there, which is why I'm choosing the 001 instead of the 901C, which is what I typically use. Um, then on the right-hand side, you can choose which of the fields to uh, bring back in. And in this case, I'm used doing the 852. So this is about as far as we've gotten at this stage. We don't have it merging correctly yet for the 852 holdings information, where there were multiple copies and thus repeated instance of the field. But we have managed to make these kind of edits on bib records where there's only one field to update per record. An example is exporting the 250 edition statement, normalizing the language in a spreadsheet, and then merging that data back on a per bib basis to the value we want to have. So these are uh, these screens about what we're working on lately. I just added this morning because um, I noticed my my uh, presentation was a little short. And that is what we have been up to. Um, so happy to uh, answer any uh, questions. Uh, be interested to hear uh, comments, that sort of thing. What um, uh, folks, th folks think. Well, I haven't seen anything in the chat. Oh, there we go. There's one. Uh, Jeremiah, I believe it would be possible to temporarily pause um, audit tables. Um, that is something we talked about a little bit um, with the amount of things that we were adding to those tables. Uh, the version of PG admin that we are using is three points. Let me find it here. Um, three something I'd have to just a minute here. Blake says three, two, two, I bet. I will take Blake's word for it. <laughs> About. Uh, version 1.22.2 from 2016. Um, that's all LOL. Uh, 3.22, I bet. Uh, where can I find more about Bib Magic? Let me refer you to my uh, friendly colleague, uh, Mr. Blake Graham Henderson. I'll he share those uh, links in the chat. Um, so it's a small thing, but I use max automator.app to change us mark to MRC. So I don't have to, yep. That was one of those things that sort of nobody tells you that, oh, you can just rename this us dot us mark to, um, dot MRC. 
and looks like that uh, Carol may have posted the. Um, yes, I reposted the links to the slides in the YouTube okay. uh, presentation from last year. So Jennifer asks, is it possible to do a batch change on call numbers in a shelving location? For example, in our juvenile easy reader, the call number is just three letters of the author's last name. Could be a J, could a J be inserted as a prefix to this? So that's essentially what I have been uh, trying to do there with the call number edits. Um, essentially what I'm trying to do is go in there, um, target a specific um, subset of records. In this case, I think it's only nonfiction records. Um, and then go and, and pull all their 852 data um, and you know put that into a spreadsheet and tweak all that stuff and do all the sort of spreadsheet magic there. And then you know recompose the uh, call number field and then have that uh, imported into my CSV file. Um, and then, you know, basically hooking on to the TCN number as my uh, connection there uh, using VLOOKUP, which is a magical tool of uh, amazing wonder. Um, and then that lets you kind of say, it used to be this, but I want it to be this for this TCN. Um, and then the trick is getting that to be, um, you know, adding those records back into the catalog with the holdings, which is where we're going next. So, um, yes, VLOOK forever. Um, so yeah, we haven't completely hammered that out yet, but we are, uh, that's what we're, what we're chewing on now, um, doing the process of importing those, those holdings and such. Um, oh yeah, Mary is saying uh, you could add the J with an item record prefix instead. Uh, that might be another option. Other questions? Anybody done other strategies for doing this kind of stuff? Will your slides have the queries? Yes, I tried to be as uh, step by step by step as I could and have all the stuff in there. Um, so yes, I've got a bunch of other things that are like the comparisons of like subfields that are invalid and some of that kind of stuff. I'm happy to share the uh, SQL files that I have for that stuff. Um, some of it relied on, we have one schema that we can write to that uh, I use for those temporary tables, but you could probably do that without having write access. Um, the only way I could manage multiple 852 fields was to create a duplicate bib record for each 852 and then match only merge to not touch the evergreen bib record on import. Okay. Um, And Blake asked, Evergreen will import the mark file with the items attached and overlay the items in Evergreen. We have yet to figure that out. That's what we are, this, this, that's our cutting edge we're working on. Um, okay, and Jennifer says, I'd be interested in how this process could happen. Any suggestions would be appreciated. So I think that has to do with the uh, call number updates that she was talking about. Um, so Mary says we've used SQL on the asset that call number to insert call number prefixes, part of the call number field, not the separate prefix, prefix field. So yeah, um, you could have uh, your hosting vendor or your database administrator um, actually modify the asset dot call number table to uh, Im import those things. Um, so that is, that's like the direct way of doing it if you have database write privileges. Uh, Daniel says for something like adding J to a group of call numbers and particularly shoving location, if you have database access, that'd be more straightforward. Um, done that a few times when the libraries requested assistance and they sent the script to Equinox, our hosting provider. Fairly straightforward three to four line script. All right. Um, so I will share my slides um, and the again that link to the uh, spreadsheet. Other tools that are sort of designed to do that. That was just my sort of hacky way of um, needing to do it and and not having the ability to install software quickly on my machine. So I went the long way around the uh, uh, island to uh, make my own process. <laughs> 
other uh, thoughts or questions? I don't see anything in feed loop. Okay. Awesome, Tiffany. <laughs> And I will say that I've done some of this when uh, doing batch editing and have my template for, you know, the overlaying with the 901C already there in the uh, batch import export. So do you use the merge only match in the, uh, does, does, do you, the check boxes that you check, is it only that 901C one? No, it's both. Both. Okay. Um, wasn't sure whether that was quite, that had something to do with our, uh, sort of merge profiles or something like that, but that's good. Uh, I don't know when I was playing around with setting it up, you know, that's what I finally found worked. And so that's what's in there. Uh, it, Jessica, it's not intuitive. <laughs> Jessica, one of our MVPs says always both. So I will take that as gospel. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I guess uh, we will give you some of your time back this afternoon. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for attending and uh, yes. we'll just share everything here. All right. So if there, I'd like to thank Benjamin for a great session and thanks to everyone for attending.